us, uh, an eminent personality. He's a chief uh, architect of IBM Watson OpenScale, an offering which helps build trust and transparency in AI. He has been with IBM for more than 18 years and has worked across different parts of the organization, including IBM Research and IBM Watson. He has a passion, sorry. He has a passion for innovation and is credited with conceptualizing several technological innovations which made an impact on IBM's products and offerings. Additionally, he is a prolific inventor and has more than 80 patents and has published more than 25 research papers in IEEE and ACM con uh, conferences. He holds a PhD in computer science from IIT Bombay where his thesis dealt with applying machine learning for problems of streaming data. We have with us Dr. Manish Bhide, and I welcome you, sir, to uh, address, uh, uh, deliver the keynote. Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thank you to the organizing committee for having me here. It's a pleasure to be speaking in front of all, you all. Uh, what I'm going to be doing today is give an industrial perspective on what it takes to take research technology and make an impact to products that industry can use. Uh, as mentioned in the introduction, I have spent almost half of my career in IBM Research, where I was a researcher writing papers, patents, and I was trying to push the technology or the inventions or the research that I was doing to the product arm of IBM and asking them to go and use that for solving customer problems. And then I decided to change gears. I, I put on a different hat. I became a, I went into the software development arm and now for the last 12 years, I have been in uh, the software development arm of IBM where I take technology that IBM Research builds and researchers like yourself build and try to use it and build products that can make an impact to the products. So I am responsible for this area called as AI governance. Um, and AI governance is something that is very important for the industry. And what I'm going to be doing today is give you examples on why it is important, what kind of problems do clients face. So let's get going. Okay. I think this should be. Okay. Okay. So um, I'm sure many of you would have built AI models, whosoever is working in the computer science area. And when we are doing research, we build a model, get some results, and we are done with it, right? In, in reality, when you build a model and you, if you have to actually deploy it into production so that customers can use it, can you give me a guess as to how much time does it take to go from starting of model development to the model actually getting deployed into production? Any guesses? Three years, okay. Six months. Answer is somewhere between the two. It can be three years as well if it's a complex model. But the thing is that it takes a lot of time to get a model into production. And why do you think that is the case? Any guesses? Why do you think, I mean, I built a model, I have proved that it's doing well. Why should it take six months or three years to get it into production? Why is it so difficult? Interdisciplinary nature, okay. Any other guess? Sorry? Validation, yes. Risk of their work, that's an excellent answer. So I'll give you a real world example. I was uh, talking to the chief data scientist of one of the biggest banks in Europe. And this gentleman told me an interesting story. He said that his, his team had built an AI model and they had gone to the line of business owner telling them that this model is great. You should go and deploy it to production. 
and he spent three hours, I'm not joking, three hours trying to convince the line of business owner that the model is great and approve it to be deployed into production. And at the end of it, they did not agree. And I'll give you an example why. There is a question of trust in AI models and this is an excellent example of why that is important. So there is a breed of dog called as Husky. Uh, it's very, it's genetically, it's closely related to Siberian wolf. So if you look at a Husky and you look at a wolf, it's very difficult to distinguish between the two. So let's say that I have built an AI model which given an image will decide whether it's of a Siberian wolf or it is of a Husky. All right. So I am a data scientist or imagine that you are a data scientist, you build this model and you are getting excellent results. These are the results that what you're seeing on the screen are the results that you're getting. So if you look at that image, the model is doing a great job in five out of the six data samples that it has. So you would say that the model is doing great, right? And you would go and tell your line of business owner that look, my model is doing great on the test data. It is doing great on five of the six data samples. So I want this to be deployed to production. And let's say that you get an approval and the model gets deployed into production and there it starts making very, I mean, it, it's, its accuracy drops significantly. It gives horrible results. Can you guess why that might be happening? Overfitting, okay. Anything else? Look at those images. There is, there is a clue in there as to what could potentially go wrong. So the, uh, notice the, the image where the model has made a mistake, which is the bottom left corner, right? That's the only image where the model made a mistake. What is unique about that image that is causing that model to make a mistake? Any guesses? Yeah. Background. That's the answer. So what the model has learned, so what happened in this case was that all the images of wolves had snow in the background. Okay, or most of the images of wolves had snow in the background and most of the images of huskies did not have snow in the background. What the model ended up learning is that if there is snow in the image, it has to be a wolf. If there is no snow in the image, it's a husky. Okay, that's what, that's what the model ended up learning. Now, when you just look at the prediction of the model, there is no way for you to figure out why the model is predicting what it is predicting. And if this model, let's say, was a very critical model that is deciding whether a person should get a loan or not, and it, it had learned something totally different than what you expect it to learn, and you deploy it into production, it will create havoc. And that is why trust in AI models is very important. And that is the reason why line of business owners worry about deploying a model into production. So how do you address that? There is something called as model explainability. And what explainability does is that it analyzes the model behavior and tells you why the model predicted something. So in this case, model, ex model explainability will identify parts of the image that are contributing significantly to the model predicting what it is predicting. So if you look, uh, the explanation for each image, there is an explanation that is shown next to it. And it is showing parts of the image that are playing the most significant role in the model prediction. And if you look at this, you would realize that when the model predicted the wolf, the top left corner, it is just focusing on the snow in the background. So this is what model explainability is and why it is important in a real world scenario. So the second problem that we have is bias in AI models. Uh, can you give, guys give, I mean, have you heard the word bias in AI models? I'm sure many of you would have heard. Uh, can you give me an example of biased behavior of AI models? Okay, yeah. And so the, the typical example given is that if you have a model that is, let's say, predicting whether a person who applied for a loan should be given a loan or not, you want that model to be fair 
to all ethnicities, to all genders, to all age groups. It should not say that I am not going to give a, mod, a, a loan to a person just because of his or her ethnicity or I am not going to give a loan to a person just because of their gender. That's not something that you expect a model to do. And there are regulations in place where if it is proved that the model is making such biased decisions, it can lead to multi-million dollar fines. So that's a problem that you need to address. So let's take the problem where uh, there is a model and it is making biased decisions for women applicants, let's say. What is the simplest way that you can avoid that bias? Any thoughts? What if I don't tell the gender of the person who applied for the loan to that model, right? So the model has no clue whether the person who has applied for a loan is a male or a female or any other gender. So it's not going to be biased for based on genders, right? I'm getting mixed answers. So the thing is, that's not really the case. And I'll give you an example. Uh, this is a real life example again. This is from a ride sharing company uh, that every one of us would have used. And this ride sharing company, uh, what they do, I mean, what they had, they had an AI model. And what it did was, now let's say that there is only one cab available in, an, in a region, all right? And two people request for a cab at the exact same time. Someone from this side requested a cab and someone from this side requested a cab at the exact same time. And this AI model is going to make a decision which of the two customers should get that cab. Okay, simple problem. And they wanted to make sure that the model is not biased towards any ethnicity. And this is a model that is used in the US, so it wanted to make sure that it is fair towards African Americans, fair towards Native Indians, fair towards Caucasians, Indians, everyone. And what they did was, they did not tell the ethnicity of the person requesting the cab to the model. So the model had no clue what was the ethnicity of the person, of the two people requesting the cab. But it was proved that the model was being biased towards specific ethnicities. Now why was that happening? One of the features of the model was the crime rate of the area from where the people were requesting the cab. So if this person is requesting a cab from an area which has a higher crime rate as compared to this person, they wanted their driver to be safe, so they said that I'll go and give the cab to a person who is requesting it from an area of lower crime rate. Sounds fair, right? Unfortunately, in the US, there is a direct correlation between crime rate and people of specific ethnicity staying in that area. So what was happening was when people of specific ethnicities were requesting a cab, they were not getting it. And this was proved and it all boiled down to the AI model making biased decisions and the company was fined multi-million dollars in fines. So that's the reason why bias in AI models is a very important and serious problem that enterprises take very, very seriously. I'll give you another example. This is an interesting example. This is from a retail company. Uh, again, I'm not going to name it, but all of you would be aware of this retail company. Uh, this retail company has a lot of uh, shops, I mean stores, and they get a lot of applications for open positions in their company, all right? Uh, and whenever a person, uh, whenever a store manager has an open position, what they do is that they go to an application and that application is powered by an AI model. What the AI model does is that it looks at all the people who have applied for jobs and it will return the top 10 candidates who can be called in for an interview. Sounds fair? This model did, did not know anything about the gender of the applicant because they had a policy that the model should not be biased towards women applicants. Still, it turned out that the model was biased towards women applicants. It was only shortlisting male candidates for the job. Why was that happening? When they analyzed it, they figured out that one of the features of the model was whether the person is willing to work in night shifts. Okay? True story by the way, I'm not making this up. Now obviously women will not be, many women will not be okay with working in night shifts. And what happened was the model said that if a person is not willing to work in night shifts, I'm not going to call them for an interview. Ended up the model not shortlisting any women applicant. Same story. Ended up with a lot of fines. So the challenge of bias is not that easy. You need to think through on how bias can creep up in AI models. 
So how do you go about detecting and mitigating bias? Uh, so bias is typically measured in different ways. The most standard way of detecting bias is what is called as a disparate impact ratio. And in order to understand that, uh, I'll, I'll just tell you a few terminology things. You want to make sure that the model is biased based on specific attribute. So you want to make sure, let's say, that the model is fair based on gender. So gender will be a fairness attribute in this case. Then you can define what can be called as, you want to be sure that the model is fair towards women applicant. They would call that a minority group. Or all other genders, let's say, we call it as a majority group. And then what is considered as a favorable outcome and what is considered as an unfavorable outcome. So uh, if this model is predicting whether a person should get a loan or not, then loan equal to approved will be one prediction of the model and that will be considered as a favorable outcome, right? So what disparate impact ratio says is that if there is an AI model and for male applicants, it is giving loan approved 70% of the times, let's say. And for women applicants, it is giving loan approved 20% of the times. So male is 70%, women is 20%. So there is a big difference between the two. If such a thing happens, the model is said to be biased according to disparate impact ratio. That's what it is doing. Now that's the standard definition of fairness, which was accepted by academia and research everywhere. We started off building a product out of it for this, and we encountered a real world problem. And what was that? So let me explain that problem. So let's take an example where the same loan processing model we want to make sure that it is being fair to people in the younger age group. So your fairness attribute in this case is age and you want to make sure that all the applicants in the age group 18 to 25 have, are, are not being discriminated against. Now let's consider a scenario where all the people in the age group 18 to 25 have a poor credit rating. They have defaulted on some credit card loans or whatever it might be. Now, what's going to happen is the model is going to say that because the people have defaulted, they have a bad credit rating, you should not be giving loans to them. So the percentage of favorable outcome for the minority group will be 0%. Whereas for some of the majority people, let's say that they have a good credit rating and the model says that the loan should be approved. Now, if you go by the standard definition of fairness, it says that the favorable outcome by, for minority by majority your numerator is going to be zero over here. So your disparate impact ratio is going to be zero, which means that the model is highly biased. But in reality, is this model biased? Is it making a biased decision? Obviously not. So that was the challenge that we encountered when we saw that w what was, you know, what was the best practice in academia at that time and what was happening in reality. So we had to come up with an alternative mechanism to avoid that. And the way we did that, was we came up with a new technique which is based on data perturbation. So the idea is the following. That let's say that the model got a loan application from a 20 year old person with, who had a poor credit rating and the model said obviously loan denied. We flipped the fairness attribute. So we changed the gen age of the person from 20 to some random majority value. So we changed it from 20 to let's say 45 and rest of the features remaining the same. We send it back to the model and see what the model predicts. Now, in this case, if the model is not biased, because this 45-year-old person has a poor credit rating, it will say that the loan is denied. And we do the same thing for a majority group. So a 50-year-old person with a good credit rating applied for a loan, loan approved. We change from 50 to 22. And if the model is fair, it will say loan approved here as well. Now, what we do is that we, rather than computing the disparate impact ratio just on the data that the model received, we compute it based on the original plus the perturbed data. And in the earlier example, what was happening was the percentage of favorable outcome for people with age below 25 was 0%. That will no longer be 0% because you look at the last row, it will say that some percentage have loan approved. So now this way, we are able to tease out the true behavior of the AI model. I'm skipping through a lot of details. I'm just telling you the gist of it. There is a lot more nuance to it. But that's the basic basis or, or root of what we tried to do to make sure that the AI model fairness that we report is not susceptible to false positives. So this is one example of how we took technology from research, looked at realistic problems, changed it, and then implemented it into a product. 
I am going to skip this for now um, in the interest of time and if there is time at the end, I will come back to this. The second problem that uh, we worry about in reality, in practice is drift detection. And drift detection, I mean the simple definition of drift is that when you train the model, again I am talking about the loan processing model. When the model was trained, uh, the, it was trained on loan applications up to let's say a million dollars. And it got deployed into production and now it is getting loan applications for two million or three million. So in this case the model would not know how to predict anything for that kind of data. So that's an example of a drift. And drift can actually come about in very surprising ways. I will give you a, a real world example for this as well. So, the same retail example, uh, retail company that I was talking about earlier. They, had an a they have an AI model to shortlist the set of candidates who can be called in for an interview, right? And they had a UI page, web page, where people who wanted a job in that company could go in and enter their details and fill in their application and it went to the backend and it then got scored by the AI model. Now, what happened was this web page had a field for educational qualification. And in the training data, educational qualification was mandatory. Now someone went and changed a field, there was a drop down, rather than making it mandatory, they made it optional. So when something is optional and a person is applying for a job in a retail company, they are not going to fill it because most likely they might not have great educational qualifications. So many of the people who were applying for a job did not enter their educational qualification. Now what does it translate to? In terms of the AI model, when it was built, it assumed that it will know the educational qualification of the person who is applying and based on that it was making decisions. And now when it is deployed into production, suddenly it is getting data where it has no clue about the educational qualification of the person. Obviously it will start making wrong decisions. And if you are not monitoring this model, then what's going to happen is that you will end up shortlisting candidates who are not the best candidates. You will end up hiring people who are not best fit. And then your store managers are going to go and shout at you that you are giving me wrong people. So these are the kinds of challenges that companies face because of which they are worried about trusting any kind of AI model. So the challenges that we talked about, first of all, we talked about explainability. How do you go and explain the behavior of an AI model? Then we talked about fairness. The third thing we talked about is model drift. So these are the kinds of challenges that, some of the set of challenges that enterprises worry about when compute, when uh, deciding whether to trust an AI model or not. Now the next question that I have for you guys is, at what stage of the model life cycle should these things be tested? And I'll give you a high level overview of the different steps of the model life cycle. It starts off with a business user saying that I want an AI model to be created for solving this business problem. Then a team of data scientists come in who go and build that model. Then it undergoes some testing and finally it is deployed into production, right? So this is the life cycle of an AI model at a very high level. Again, there are a lot of sub steps in it which I have missed, which I have uh, skipped. But with this stage, at what stages do you think we should check for things such as fairness, explainability, drift detection, quality monitoring? Any thoughts on when, if you were responsible for this entire life cycle, at what stage would you want to test these kind of metrics? Validation. Model validation, yes, absolutely right. Any other stage? Development itself, yes. Any other stage? and monitoring, yes. So I'll give you a reason. So the point is, you need to test these capabilities at each stage of the model life cycle. The first thing that you need to do is, when you're building the model, is the training data that you're using, that itself should not be biased. Because if in the training data, the training data says that for all, all uh, young population, the loan should be denied. Obviously the model is going to learn that if the age is less than 25, deny a loan, right? So you need to first test whether the training data itself is not biased. Then you need to build a model and make sure that the model that has been built is not biased. Then at validation, obviously model validators, they are responsible for testing the model. So you need to do that. And after you have deployed the model into production, you still need to do this testing. Because if you go back to the retail use case example that I talked about, 
where the educational qualification started coming out as null values, then that is something that you will only be able to detect after the model is deployed into production, right? So all of these metrics need to be computed at every stage of the model life cycle. And how do you go about doing that? That is where AI governance comes into picture. So AI governance is understanding everything about the AI model. What kind, why was the model built? Uh, was the data that was used for building the model f uh, bias free? What was the fairness of the model when it was built? What kind of validation was done? What were the results of the validation? What kind of data was used for validation? And how is the model been performing after it has been deployed into production? So all the information about the model at each and every step of the model life cycle is what AI governance is about. And this is very critical to make sure that enterprises can trust their AI model. So the examples that I gave where a model owner or a line of business owner was not willing to agree to deploy a model into production. In order to avoid those kind of things, this is very critical. I'll give you another example, another reason why this is important. So if you look at this life cycle, um, when a data scientist builds a model for solving a business problem, how many AI models do you think they would, have, they would try before saying that this is the model that I want to push forward? Any guesses, wild guesses? Order of tens, yes. So they spend months building an A model. They will try out different algorithms, they will try out different data, they will try out different parameters. So they are going to build out, let's say, 20, 30 odd models and then finally decide that, okay, this is the model that is the best of the lot. I'm going to send it to the model validator and ask him or her to push it to production, right? So that's the way it works. Now, typically in these enterprises, what happens is, the data scientists, let's say they spend a month or two and over a period of 60 odd days, they have built 30 odd models. They selected one, sent it to the model validator. These model validation teams are very busy, right? They are not going to go and start testing it immediately. They'll t t start testing it, uh, let's say 15 days from there. After that point in time, they will start testing and they look at the results and say that, look, you have used a deep learning model. I, it's very difficult to explain the behavior of a deep learning model. Why have you used a deep learning model? Can, why did you not use, let's say, a scikit-learn model? Now, if I'm a data scientist and I get this question, I would have to go and dig up my notes, which were like the work that I did two months back, and figure out that, okay, I had tried a scikit-learn model, but it was not getting the kind of accuracy that I wanted. And then they need to go and prove to the model validator that, look, the model accuracy was not great, here are the results to prove that, and that is why I ended up building a deep learning model. So this back and forth between a validator and a data scientist ends up taking a lot of time, and that is why it takes months, six months or years to deploy a model into production, right? This is one of the culprits for that, the, of why it takes a long time for models to be deployed into production. So how do we solve this? Um, IBM Research came up with an interesting concept called as fact sheets. Now, we are all aware of nutritional labels on food products, right? Whenever you buy a pack of chips, you would see at the back there will be a nutritional label on it, which says that if you, every 100 grams contains so many calories, so much sodium, and blah, blah, blah. Similar thing exists for uh, energy rating, I mean you buy a fridge or you buy an AC, it will say it's a 5 star AC or a 3 star AC or whatever that is, right? The idea behind fact sheets, which is a concept invented by IBM Research, is to have similar standard labels for AI models, where all the information about the AI models will be available in a standard terminology. And you will end up collecting facts about the model at every stage of the life cycle. So the fact sheet will have information about who requested that model, what was the use case for, then when it was built, what kind of testing was done, what kind of precision and recall and RO seeker and whatever. All of that information will be available in a standard format. Now if you go back to the problem that I mentioned where model validator was asking a question to the data scientist, did you try out a scikit-learn model? What's going to happen is there will be fact sheets available which will show information about each of the 30-odd models that a data scientist has built, 
and they will be available to the model validator. So validator will not have to ask those questions to the data scientist. All of that will be automatically available and then they will be able to just look at those facts, look at those fact sheets and say that, okay, the data scientist did try building a, a simpler model and it didn't have the kind of fairness or it didn't have the kind of quality that we expect and that is why the model was not selected and they ended up selecting a deep learning model. So this is what AI governance is about. AI governance is about collecting facts at every stage of the life cycle in an automated manner so that the time it takes to deploy a model into production, the ensuring that the model is not acting in a biased manner, ensuring that the model is not drifted, ensuring that the quality of the model is great, ensuring that the explainability of the model is good. All of these things are taken care of in AI governance and that is what helps scale the adoption of AI in enterprises. So that was a quick high level overview on what AI governance is about. Uh, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer. Uh, I do have a blog where I talk about a bunch of things on AI governance. I'll, I'll go back to the first screen which has the details of that. So that's my blog. Uh, it has a lot of uh, interesting blogs, uh, topics on everything that I talked about, uh, the challenges that we face about fairness, some of the things that I skipped like indirect bias, um, drift detection and why that is relevant to the industry. Uh, please feel free to go and take it, uh, take a read. If you have any questions, you can reach out to me via Twitter or LinkedIn. I'll be more than happy to answer. Thank you so much. How good a uh, model uh, like IBM Watson is for, uh, because it is being used for so many applications. Yeah. Right. So uh, this AI governance is part of IBM Watson. Uh, there are different parts to Watson. There is a technology that helps companies build their AI models and deploy their AI models and govern their AI models. That's one part of it, where we are providing tooling to build models at scale, to deploy and score models at scale and to govern them. There is yet another part to it, which is uh, things such as NLP classification, where there are models that you can readily use for uh, classification of uh, images or uh, classification of text data or doing NLP on models. So these kind of models are used across one of some of the biggest companies in the world and we continuously keep improving on it. So the short answer to your question is that uh, we have models that are best of the breed thanks to our collaboration with IBM Research. But there is a lot more to it as well, where we are not just providing models, but we are enabling our customers to build their own models, deploy them, use them, and govern them at scale. Okay, uh, I have just one more question. Sure, go ahead, yeah. yeah. Uh, recently, I mean, for the last few years, if you look at uh, AI is being extensively explored by academic uh, community as well, for various types of problems. Uh, personally, I work on wireless communication, so I have seen a lot of people applying AI on a lot of wireless communication applications, getting sometimes claiming results which are not analytically explainable. In the sense, this, there are some theoretical bounds and people are claiming that they are getting better than the bounds. So uh, the question is, uh, uh, is it really possible, first of all? Second, uh, uh, are there any ways to mathematically uh, explain the results that we are getting through AI models? Yeah. Great question. Um, and it touches upon the explainability point that I was mentioning earlier. Uh, so model explainability is one of the fundamental areas which are very critical to start getting trust into an AI model. And it, it exactly addresses the question that you were talking about. What explainability does is that if you're getting a result, why is the model predicting what it predicted, right? It, so for example, if someone says, why was my loan rejected? With explainability techniques, you will be able to pinpoint that the model said that your loan should be rejected because you have defaulted on a loan in the past and you didn't, you didn't have a co-applicant and the amount of savings that you have is, is very less. So the model is given, let's say, 100 parameters about the customer out of those 100 parameters, what are the top three that influence the model to believe that the loan should be rejected? So that is what it is able to identify and the top three, as I said, could be 
the fact that the person had defaulted, the person didn't have a good credit rating, didn't have a lot of amount in their bank. So those are the three that the bank identified, or that the model identified, and that is what explainability provides. So exactly the question that you raised, that can be answered with model explainability. So there are two kinds of explainability techniques. There is a white box technique and a, a black box techniques. Uh, in a white box technique, you can give mathematical justification on why the model predicted what it predicted. Because it understands how the model is internally working. Uh, but if it is a complex model, let's say that it is an ensemble model. It's not one model. You have four models which are one model is predicting something that is input to the second and so on and so forth. Then it becomes difficult to give a precise explanation and that is where a black box technique comes in, where it will m provide the best guess on why the model is predicting what it's predicting. So in some cases that can be done, but not in all. Uh, sir? sir, so earlier in the example of uh, night shift or in the example of uh, crime rate uh, deciding the taxi company, what if these characters which lead to the bias are extremely important for the decision? Like there is a job that requires night shift. Uh, a control room operator, there needs to be night shift. So that time we just can't say, yes, women and men need to be equal, so I will take equal women. So how do we make sure? Yeah, continue. I'm just pulling up some slide which will be relevant so, to your So question. how do we differentiate between is the model being biased or is the job requiring a role that may be conferring with a social bias? Right. So. Uh, one of the things that I did not touch upon is that there are some thresholds based on which you can decide whether the model is biased or not. So if you look at the desperate impact ratio, it says ratio of favorable outcome for minority divided by favorable outcome for majority, right? If this is one, means that you are giving a loan approved outcome equal for male and female. Typically, the standard definition of fairness is that if this value is less than 0 0.8, then you would say that the model is acting in a biased manner. Now coming to the example that you raised, that if let's say that the job is very dangerous for women applicants, although I don't believe any job can be dangerous for any kind of gender, but let's say that for some company, they want to, they are okay with uh, some percent, not having equal weights to both the genders. What can be done is that this ratio, this threshold can be changed. They can set it to 0.5. We don't get into the business of saying that what threshold should be used. That is up to the discretion of the client, right? They can decide based on their use case what threshold makes sense for their use case. And they, if they set it to 0.5, which means that they are okay with not having equal parity, but at least 50% parity. And then that can be addressed using the threshold. Yeah, so uh, my question is, uh, I think it, in, it was not covered, but it is relevant to it. So my question is, we build multiple AI models for different kind of applications, be it like NLP or image classification. And uh, you spoke on one point where, uh, you know, you built maybe 20, 30 models, but still you were not getting the results. So uh, even I used to work on many AI models and sometimes we uh, never get the results uh, what we wanted, but uh, is there any methodology or procedure uh, that you follow so that you come to know where uh, the mistake is coming up? Like, is there any some parameter mistake that you're taking or the model you're applying is wrong? So do you follow any uh, process or any standardized method for that? Great point. So I'll give you two answers. Um, there is a bunch of techniques called as auto AI. Uh, what it does is that it, you give a problem statement to the auto AI and it will internally build multiple models. It might be hundreds of models for you and automatically identify which is the one that is giving you the best result, right? So rather than you doing all the work, auto AI will do this work for you and say that this is the model that gave me the best result and you can then download that model and then tweak it further to improve it further. Okay, that's one way of doing things. Uh, then the so that will help you avoid the pain of uh, selecting the right model. So that's, that's actually one way. And uh, the other way that I can think of is um, working in a collaborative manner. So what happens is data science, we say, is, is actually a team sport. Uh, it's not that you just go and build your models in isolation. 
uh, in a team, typically you will have experienced data scientist and newbie data scientist. And what we build is we build technology by which the knowledge from the best of breed data scientist can be used by the newbie data scientist. So it's basically with collaboration and understanding from people who have been in that industry for a long time, you can then up gain from that and build models that are best placed for your use cases. Can we actually have governance? Like uh, what I was, un what I understood is like for the models that you are building, you are helping in governing them. Or can we think of governance as a service in future? Is that something that you see? Some model somebody is creating, you are able to find out and then work it out. Is yeah, absolutely. that the direction, or is it already in? Um, so this is a product that is available as a service. Uh, uh -huh. It's available for our customers, and we have customers using it. But what happens is, uh, many a times, let's say I am a retail company, and for predicting who of my customers are likely to leave, rather than my data scientist going and building them, mm -hmm. I can go and buy a model from a, from a third-party vendor. Right. right. So when I am buying a model from a third-party vendor, I have no clue what training data they had used, how, right. what kind of methodology they had used, because right. it's a black box to me. Yeah. So we should still be able to govern those kind of models. And there are techniques for doing that. There are techniques where, um, what you can do is you can analyze the behavior of the model in production. You can give it different kinds of data right. and figure out what it is doing. So although you will not have the development time facts, but you will have the runtime facts. Right. So that's the best that can be done in that space. So there will be some benchmark data from which you are just gaining. Correct. Correct. You and can still do the testing and we can come up with a risk score, let's say, uh -huh. saying that, look, this model based on what analysis I have done, it is so and so risky. Right, right. Yeah. Thank you. So one other thing, coming back to the point you are making, uh, there is an interesting explainability technique, uh, which is what it does is, if let's say that an AI model says that a loan should be denied for this person, what the explainability technique does is that it is able to point out the records in your training data, which are very similar to the person whose loan was rejected. And they say that, okay, this person, the model said that this loan should be rejected because there were these four records in my training data, which, which are very similar to this case, and that's why the model said the loan was rejected. Now, coming back to how you can improve the model. Let's say you have built a model, and it is making wrong decisions. Then, on the data points where it is making wrong decisions, you can find out what part of the training data is contributing to those wrong decisions. And then, remove that data or relabel the data and retrain the model. That's one other way in which algorithms from governance can help you build better models. Just a uh, layman's question. So you're talking about the, the taxi cab services. See, two persons are, you're telling from two sides, two persons are registering. See, by the time, the moment they have registered, their identification is available in the database. Does the service provider, anyway, use the data available among the customers? Because, you know, see, you said the document may be uh, crime rate is more like that. See, the person who is asking for a cab, his name or number, phone number is already registered in the provider's database. Naturally, he will have, some when you search for a Google or something like that, the ad that you get is based on what previous uh, searches that you have made. That way, the service provider has any access to the data available on the customers, prospective customers. How do they use that? Yeah, so you're absolutely right. Uh, the service provider will have access to the data. Um, well, let me put it this way. They may or may not have enough data for the customer to make a decision. So if let's say that the customer is a new customer and this, they are using, it, using the cab service for the first time, they would not know anything about it. On the other hand, if the customer has, is a regular customer, they would know for sure what is the rating given by the driver to the customer, right? That could be a very good indicator to decide whether this customer should be given a cab or not, right? So there are, I mean, there is two sides to it. They, you may or may not have data about the customer. And ideally, you should give, if you have data, you should give more weightage to the rating given to the customer by the driver as opposed to the area from where the customer is requesting a cab. Let me, let me have a question. I'll make it very quick. I'll make it very quick. Uh, the winning trust is the central Can theme. you hold it closer? I can't hear you. My audible? Yeah. yeah. Winning trust is the central theme of AI governance. Winning trust of 
senior management for your AI model. Now, um, make it fast, as soon as possible. That's the key thing. I mean, don't take too much of time. You have a life cycle to follow. That's one of the things, yes. Yeah, you have a large life, life cycle to follow. Make it as quickly as possible is the number one uh, approach. Now, to run an agile path, how would you actually go about uh, using that last metric, that is the drift or the non-stationary models? If, that you, if you factor that into this whole three matrices, uh, will it actually win the agile path? Because it's going to be a deployment and further deployment, you need to look for the drift. And that's deployment being the last part of your life cycle. You will be looping around the deployment stage. Yeah. So, so how, do, how do I make it? How do we actually make it a agile approach? It's an excellent point. And the way companies do that is that if there is a drift, or if there is an accuracy drop, then uh, with AI governance, you can automatically identify the fact or what are the data points that have drifted, or what are the data points where the accuracy has dropped, and send it to a human agent to send to relabel it and kick off a pipeline that will add that annotated data back to your training data and retrain the model to come up with a new version that can be deployed. So automate all the tests that are there in the life cycle on the additional data that has been identified as drifted or where quality has dropped and create up, come up with a new version of the model that can get deployed. So that way you can bring in automation and do it in an agile manner. Yes.